This is a list of Jupiter's 95 confirmed moons. Out of these, the ones most talked about are the four major ones. Io, the most volcanically active object in the solar system, Europa, a moon with strong evidence of a subsurface ocean, Ganymede, the largest known moon so far, it is even larger than the planet Mercury, and Callisto, a place with one of the most ancient surfaces in the solar system. So it is understandable that these moons are talked about so frequently. Their unique characteristics outshine the countless other moons that Jupiter has. And even though there are so many of them, they take up about only 0.003% the total mass of the moons of Jupiter. Still, these moons being much less exciting than the four major ones doesn't mean that there isn't anything interesting about them. Moons of Jupiter can be divided into two broad categories, regular and irregular moons. Regular moons of Jupiter and regular moons in general are typically the ones that formed from the materials that were in a protoplanetary disk that was orbiting around the equator. That's why the non-captured, regular moons all have orbits that go around the equator of Jupiter. They formed out of the disk that was going around the equator. Besides that, all of the regular moons have very circular orbits, and they are all right next to each other, and in total, eight of them are currently known. Four being the four major spherical ones, and the other four being the closer, inner, non-spherical ones. Now the thing is that with at least two regular moons, there is some possibility that they were captured, and we are going to discuss that possibility later in the video. Jupiter's irregular moons have very different characteristics compared to the regular moons. They all orbit Jupiter beyond the distance of Callisto. They also all have heavily inclined orbits, inclined relative to the equator of Jupiter. They all also have very eccentric, elongated orbits. All of those facts together point towards the idea that these irregular moons were captured by Jupiter, meaning they didn't form from the equatorial protoplanetary disk that was once around Jupiter. Now, out of Jupiter's 87 irregular moons, the vast majority, that is 74 of them, have retrograde orbits, meaning they orbit in the opposite direction in which Jupiter rotates around itself. It is also somewhat bizarre that they are also very neatly divided by distance, at least as far as we know. Every single moon currently found with an average orbital distance beyond 19 million kilometers has a retrograde orbit. The most distant moon of Jupiter found so far is Kari, with an average distance of 24 million and 200,000 kilometers. For some comparison, the closest distance between Earth and Venus is 38 million kilometers. However, this is just the average distance between Kari and Jupiter. Like all other irregular moons, its orbit is very eccentric, so at its most distant point from Jupiter, it gets as far away as 31 million and 500,000 kilometers. However, despite the average distance of this moon being so great, one other moon, Aedi, has a slightly closer average distance. Yet despite this, because its orbit is much more elongated, that is much more eccentric, it also gets much further away from Jupiter, about 34 million and 500,000 kilometers away, very similar to the closest distance between Earth and Venus. And yet, despite this enormous distance from Kari and Aedi, Jupiter would still appear to be as a spherical object, and some details of its surface could still be distinguished. But it would still appear to be quite a bit smaller than the moon does from Earth. Both Aedi and Kari need a bit more than two years to complete an orbit around Jupiter, so a similar time that Mars needs to complete an orbit around the Sun. Both of these moons are also tiny, likely both less than 5 kilometers in diameter, but this is very typical for an irregular moon in general. The average size of Jupiter's irregular moons is only a diameter of about 7.5 kilometers. It is very likely that the actual number of moons around Jupiter is much greater than just 95 moons. Some estimates put the actual number at a couple hundred, but also most of those moons are expected to be tiny. They are expected to have a diameter of less than one kilometer. Although Kari and Aedi are pretty far away, it is very likely that there are currently undiscovered moons of Jupiter that are much further away. That is because the hill sphere of Jupiter is about 53 million kilometers, 
that is its gravitational sphere of influence. So potentially, there are moons of Jupiter that are as distant from Jupiter as Mercury is from the Sun. However, this isn't certain. But what is certain is that we already know of three moons that are as far away from the object that they are orbiting as Mercury is from the Sun. I'm talking about Neptune, which has three such moons. That makes sense given that the hill sphere of Neptune is even greater than that of Jupiter. It is about 160 million kilometers. Now that might seem a bit confusing given that Neptune is much smaller than Jupiter. However, the reason that the hill sphere is so much larger is because Neptune is a lot lonelier, meaning it is a lot more further away from other significant objects compared to Jupiter. That same effect of being in a crowded area diminishing the hill sphere is also why Pluto, which is smaller than the moon, has a larger hill sphere compared to Earth. Both Kari and Aedi belong to the group called Pasiphae. Pasiphae has 18 moons. They are named after the largest moon in the group, which is, well, Pasiphae. And with a diameter of 58 kilometers, it is unusually large. This group of moons maybe originates from a single impact that scattered the objects around. However, that doesn't appear to be very likely, considering that there is a large variety in how much their orbits are inclined. And beyond that, there is also a variety in the composition of their surface, which is why some of them are gray while others are light red. So there is a good chance that this group contains moons that were captured from all over the solar system. However, there are groups of Jupiter's moons that are closer and that have strong evidence of originating from an impact of a single object. The group that comes next in terms of distance to Jupiter is the Carmi group, named after the unusually large object in the group, which has a diameter of 47 kilometers. The Carmi group has 30 moons, the most out of any group of Jupiter's moons. All 30 of these moons have incredibly similar orbital inclinations. And beyond that, they also all appear to have a light red color. Now, the orbital inclination of these moons is really quite incredible. It is 164 degrees for every single moon in the group. However, this might be confusing. How is 164 degrees even possible? Well, technically, it is true that 164 degrees could also be said to be just simply 16 degrees. But objects with retrograde orbits have their inclinations designated through 180 degrees and lower. Besides the incredibly similar orbital inclination and the similar color of these moons, there is also the incredibly similar average orbital distance to Jupiter. All of them have an average distance to Jupiter that differs at most by about 600,000 kilometers. So this is also the most crowded group of moons that Jupiter has. After Carmi, the next group in terms of distance to Jupiter is the Anangiki group. It is named after the largest satellite in the group that has a diameter of 29 kilometers. Now this group potentially did form out of an impact of a single object. However, the evidence for that is not as strong as for the Carmi group. The orbital inclination of the satellites in this group ranges from 144 to 155 degrees. So not even close to the similarity that the Carmi group has. On top of that, the satellites in this group appear to have more variation in the color of their surfaces. So those two things together don't allow us to precisely say what the origin of these satellites is. After the Anangiki group comes the Valetudo satellite, which doesn't really belong to a group. It is a tiny moon with a diameter of one kilometer. Beyond this tiny moon, so every moon known so far that is more distant to Jupiter, has a retrograde orbit. So every known moon beyond an average orbital distance of 19 million kilometers. But every moon that is closer than Valetudo to Jupiter has a prograde orbit. Valetudo itself has a prograde orbit and an orbital inclination of 34.5 degrees. That's why in the list there appears to be this drastic increase in the orbital inclination. That is just how the inclination of retrograde moons is described. If Valetudo were a retrograde moon, its 35 degree orbit would be written as 145 degrees. After Valetudo comes the Carpo group, which only has two tiny moons, Carpo and one without a real name. They belong to the same group due to their distance and their really incredibly tilted orbits. However, the orbit of Carpo 
is also very unstable, as shown by this animation. After the Carpo group, there is this massive gap in the average orbital distance of the next closest object. The gap is about 4 million kilometers, at least as far as we currently know. So what comes after Carpo is the Himalaya group of prograde moons. The group is named after the largest satellite in the group, which has a diameter of 140 kilometers. That is huge compared to other tiny irregular moons of Jupiter. It is the sixth largest moon of Jupiter, and potentially the fifth most massive one. Yes, it is potentially more massive than one other moon that is significantly larger and closer to Jupiter. But there are also two other unusually large satellites in the Himalaya group, that is Elera at 80 kilometers and Lysithia at 42 kilometers. Himalaya the moon has good potential to eventually collide with Elera, and there is also potential for it to eventually collide with the distant Pasiphae. The Himalaya group of moons all have very similar orbital inclinations that are between 27 and 29 degrees, so not as impressive as the Karmi group, but still close enough to conclude that these formed from an impact of a single body. That is especially convincing considering that all of these also have a very similar surface color and considering that all of these are very close to each other, with an average orbital distance difference of 1 million kilometers between the most distant and the closest moon of the group. After the Himalaya group comes Themisto. It doesn't really belong to a group, it's a single satellite. This is Jupiter's loneliest moon, loneliest in a sense that its average orbital distance is incredibly far away, both from the moons that are inwards and outwards. Themisto orbits Jupiter at an average distance of 7.4 million kilometers. But beyond Themisto, outwards comes Leda, from the Himalaya group, which has an average orbital distance of 11 million kilometers. And the closest known moon to Themisto inwards is Callisto, which orbits Jupiter at a distance of 1.8 million kilometers. Now potentially it could be the case that there are some moons in these huge gaps. However, so far the existence of those isn't known, and it is overall pretty likely that Themisto is still in one of the least crowded areas around Jupiter. After Themisto, going closer to Jupiter, there are Jupiter's regular moons. Specifically, Callisto comes next, then Ganymede, then Europa, and then Io. But out of the regular moons, four go largely unnoticed, and those are the non-major, non-spherical ones. After Io comes Thebe. This moon was photographed with at least enough detail, such that we can distinguish a large crater on it that is 40 kilometers across. Thebe itself is about 100 kilometers across. It is orbiting Jupiter at a distance of 220,000 kilometers so quite a bit closer than the distance of the moon to Earth, which is about 380,000 kilometers. Its orbit is just very slightly inclined at 1 degree, which is somewhat unusual for a regular moon. Potentially, this is due to the influence of the much larger moon Io. Thebe is very close to the edge of the outermost ring of Jupiter, a very faint ring that Thebe contributes material to through the impacts that spread the dust from its surface. After Thebe, we encounter Amalthea, the fifth largest moon of Jupiter. Its diameter is 167 kilometers, so it's not massive and large enough to become spherical due to its gravity. Still, it's pretty large for an asteroid-shaped object. This satellite, along with Thebe, had their spectra examined, and the spectra that they have suggests that they have hydrous minerals. This means that Amalthea and Thebe very likely didn't form at their current orbital distance to Jupiter, because in the past, during the protoplanetary disk phase, it was far too hot at that distance to Jupiter for hydrous minerals to be the building blocks of these moons. There are two potential reasons for this. One is that they formed at a distance that is much greater to Jupiter, which could support the existence of solid hydrous minerals. They could have, for example, formed around Callisto and then slowly started getting closer to Jupiter. The second possibility is that these two moons are actually captured, meaning they may be formed in distant, colder regions where there are solid hydrous minerals and then got captured by Jupiter. The problem with this second capturing possibility is that the orbital characteristics of these two moons are far too similar to certainly non-captured satellites such as Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. 
Although, yes, DB does have an orbital inclination of 1 degree, which is a bit unusual, that is still much closer to the orbital inclination of non-captured moons than the inclination of captured moons. Not a single known irregular moon in the solar system has an inclination that is less than 1 degree. On top of that, both Thebe and Amalthea have very circular prograde orbits. Now, it maybe is the case that something caused for these two moons to get the same orbital characteristics as non-captured moons, but it's really hard to say as to what process could lower the orbital inclination and eccentricity. The density of the moon Amalthea is estimated to be 0.86 grams per centimeter cubic. This is lower than the density of water ice. So Amalthea is very likely to some degree porous and it is likely composed of a mixture of water ice and rock. Amalthea is in the middle of Jupiter's outer ring. Likely it contributes quite a bit of material to the ring. Amalthea is the fifth largest moon of Jupiter and also the fifth moon of Jupiter discovered. Nearly three centuries after the discovery of the four major moons, Amalthea was discovered in 1892. Besides a couple of other irregular moons which were discovered at a similar time, most currently known moons of Jupiter were discovered around the year 2000. After Amalthea comes Adrastea, which orbits Jupiter at 129,000 kilometers. There is Mithas, which is closer to Jupiter by only about 1,000 kilometers. So it orbits at a distance of 128,000 kilometers. For both Adrastea and Mithas, we can obviously expect for Jupiter to appear many times larger in the sky from their surfaces than the moon does from Earth. But not only that, during certain rare moments, Adrastea and Mithas can get so incredibly close to each other that from each one, the other one would also appear larger in the sky than the moon does from Earth. And that is despite these two moons being tiny when compared to the moon. Mithas has a diameter of about 43 kilometers and Adrastea about 16 kilometers. Although we have a good idea of their size, unlike Thebe and Amalthea, the Galileo spacecraft didn't manage to capture high quality photos of Adrastea and Mithas, especially not of Adrastea. But one potential feature that we can maybe predict is the existence of an equatorial ridge that is present due to these moons pulling the material off of the ring onto their equator. These two moons are basically right next to the ring. However, besides pulling the material, we also know that these two small moons are the biggest contributors to the material present in Jupiter's brightest ring. They can contribute likely because their surface is pretty porous, so dust can be scattered around. These two moons are also somewhat remarkable in that they both only need about seven and a half hours to complete a full orbit around Jupiter. That is less time than Jupiter needs to complete a rotation around itself. Although not as exciting as the major regular moons, we still know quite a few interesting things about Jupiter's other moons. However, beyond just discovering more of them, which is very likely to happen, the details about them are going to remain unknown for likely at least many decades, if not centuries. That is because the resources necessary for spacecrafts are simply better spent exploring objects with more potential. It makes sense that the in-depth exploration of these moons is really only going to come after examining the more promising objects. Potentially even during a certain amount of time where there are some human colonies somewhere beyond Earth, even then the details of these moons could still be unknown at that point. 